Hey guys, John Paulamy here, Actionable Intelligence. Today is Saturday, October 1st, and this is the weekly market update. As usual, the disclaimer, anything that you hear or see in this video or podcast is not to be taken as investment advice, not a registered financial advisor. I cannot give you personal financial advice. Please do your own due diligence. It's your money. It's your responsibility. Okay, we're going to try a little bit different format. Um, some weekly commentary first, and then we'll get into the slides. The commentary obviously will uh, segue into the slides and pertain to the slides. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, big news in my my book, the the sabotage, the attack, whatever you want to characterize it, of the Nord Stream 1 and 2 pipelines. Now, I'm not going to get into speculating as to who did it, um, or for what reason, I think what's more important to do is to focus. Well, I will say one thing. Let me let me just give you my geopolitical framework of how I think that things are working in the world. And maybe I'll do a video on this. It's, it's way beyond the scope of the weekly market update. But basically, I believe that the U.S. foreign policy as it pertains to Europe is um, keep the U.S. in Europe, keep the Russians out of Europe and keep Germany down. And so very simply what that means is, is that, um, you know, you have the Eurasian island, if you will, uh, with Europe and Asia, with the possibility of it creating a common economic block. Many people have wanted to do this for many years. Um, and you would use technology and manufacturing prowess in Europe, specifically Germany, coupling that with cheap Russian energy and um, materials. And then, you know, these markets that you would have all the way from basically Lisbon to Vladivostok. So that's the Eurasian island, a common co-economic prosperity uh, sphere, if you would. And then, you know, the U.S. is not up for this. And this is this is a something that's been talked about for decades and in, in, in going back to like the turn of the 20th century. This uh, theory was put forward. Uh, so then you have like the U.S. over here on the other side of the Atlantic all by itself. How does it fit into something like that? Something like that was to come to fruition. And so I believe that the U.S. has always been against that uh, from geopolitical hegemon type uh, view that it has, um, how it would not be able to necessarily compete economically or would have it would not have the hegemon it has now. This is what I think that many policymakers in the U.S. feel. And so, you know, keeping Russia out means, you know, keeping that cheap energy out, keeping the relations, uh, you know, oppositional, not collaborative. And so, you know, with the Nord Stream 1 and 2, which nobody in the U.S. really wanted, okay, this goes all the way back to, you can find videos online with Condoleezza Rice even saying this. Uh, you can see that the, the president, uh, current president Biden, talked about even before the conflict started in Ukraine, that they would not allow Nord Stream 2 to come online and that it could be destroyed. Victoria Newland said something similar. Uh, it was interesting that after the uh, explosion or sabotage or attack, whatever you want to call it, um, the uh, one of the MPs in Poland, who is married actually to neocon author uh, Ann Applebaum, here in the U.S. and is also a former, uh, I think, defense minister in Poland. He made a tweet that he has subsequently taken down, saying, "Thank you, USA." Uh, he was referring to the uh, to the deal there. So my view is is that if you know, um, you, we're not going to really know who did what. It's speculation. But my view is is that who had motive and opportunity, and if you approach it from the geopolitical perspective, that there were a lot of unrest and calls for uh, at least starting to take hold in Germany and other countries like the Czech Republic for reproachment with Russia to turn the gas back on. Now that's absolutely off the table. It cannot happen. Uh, people are saying that speculating or even people in the know that the pipelines can be destroyed forever. Uh, they cannot be fixed. We don't really know. We don't have enough information yet. Suffice to say that they will not be available for the next for this winter or if they do decide to be fixed, how long that would take. We don't have that information. 
So what I would like to mostly focus on, having said that, you know, um, like I said, any any saying that it was Russia, saying it was the U.S., saying it was Poland, saying it was the U.K., MI6, this is all speculation. But I think, you know, if you use Occam's razor and then, again, who has motive, who has opportunity, who benefits from this, um, then you can come to some type of reasonable conclusion. But it's irrelevant, really. What's more relevant and I think interesting is this basically seals the fate of the energy crisis for Europe uh, for the near and medium term. Um, what does that mean, you know, economically, socially, politically? Uh, we recently saw, you know, the political dominoes continue to fall. We saw the Swedish Democrats want a slim majority in Sweden. They'll take power now. I'm not saying they're right wing fascists or whatever, but they're center right, I guess, is what you would classify them. Um, you saw the recent uh, elections in Italy. You know, these things are not going, you know, people, I think, are overemphasizing the results. These people are all pro-EU. They don't want to get out of the EU. They don't want to have their own currency. That would be radical. That would be something to celebrate. These things are going to have to happen incrementally. Um, so these people come to power. They say the right things, supposedly, in their speeches. But what are they really going to do? Okay. Uh, Russia just turned off, Gazprom just turned off the gas to Italy this morning. As a matter of fact, it was a news item that I saw when I got up. So what is the, you know, these things are, you know, as the populace thinks that it went to the ballot. Remember, my, my, my view is that you're not going to solve these things at the ballot box. Okay. You're going to need the wheels to completely come off. And if you want real change, it's going to have to be a revolution. And it's not going to be done at a ballot box. That's just how things really change. Uh, otherwise, the bankers, the people in Brussels, the people in D.C., the people in the city of London, they're going to do everything they can to maintain their control. Do you think that they're going to say, well, Georgia Maloney, who's for God, family and country, came to power? Oh, well, let's shut everything down and go home. Uh, they win. That's not how things work. So it's going to be a titanic struggle. But I think as things get worse, uh, you know, I think that a lot of the ruling class probably believes that if things get bad enough that the people that they'll be open for, you know, bugs, not burgers, central, you know, central bank, digital currencies, total social control. I think that's what's going to be offered after everything, after the wheels come off. But I'm not sure that the masters of the universe have this gamed out properly. Um, you know, you've already seen uh, they're preparing, you know, for the civil unrest that's going to come. They're preparing for, you know, these things to roll out once things get bad enough, because people are not going to be interested in, I think, accepting these things voluntarily. So it'll kind of be like, you know, you're totally desperate, but here's the salvation, you know, kind of that devil's bargain. So enough on the geopolitics, uh, you know, everybody has their own view on it. Uh, Every time that I put forth a view, some people agree, some people disagree. It's kind of a distraction because it doesn't matter. What matters is, is what is going to happen vis-a-vis -vis the markets? What's going to happen uh, to our positions? What's going to happen uh, to uh, allow us to, or what should we be thinking about? So um, let's go to the slide deck for this week and talk about it. So first of all, uh, the situation in the European Union is going to skew world LNG prices higher. Uh, it's quite obvious to me that, you know, natural gas, the, you're not going to have an energy transition in the next three to six months to renewables or whatever they, 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 they were planning there. Basically like 40 to 50% of the gas is offline, possibly permanently. So what's going to, this is a slide from Total, which is a French uh, large international integrated oil and gas company. So I was talking about, this is before what happened, but uh, I was talking about, uh, um, you know, the situation of Russian gas dependency creating tensions on LNG and gas markets. So if you go over here to the left European LNG import potential, it says a new 100 million tons per year market for LNG. That would be 25% of world LNG demand. New European LNG demand competing with Asia and driving higher prices. So that's what we can. That's what we can think. We're going to have higher gas prices worldwide now, okay? Because of sanctions, because of discombobulation in markets, because of pipeline infrastructure being blown up. 
um, to get the gas to where it needs to go is going to cost more and take longer and require uh, more shipping activity. Um, it says here, EU call on LNG partially offset by potential demand destruction. Yeah, there are people like Habeck and these other greens and leftists in Europe are calling for all kinds of, you know, take less showers, turn heat down, all this kind of uh, stuff. So uh, notwithstanding the fact that the deindustrialization de of Germany is now taking place. You know, I find it interesting. People forget. They don't really look at all the intricacies what, going on, what go on goes on in, in these markets and in the news. You know, one of the direct beneficiaries of German deindustrialization is Poland. Poland just opened the day, I believe, of or after Nord Stream 1 and 2 blew up. Poland just in, inaugurated uh, and kicked off a new pipeline for gas to come from Norway to Poland. Did anybody talk about that? Um, did you know that recently the parliament in Poland has passed legislation or passed a decree or whatever legislation that it wants a, over a trillion dollars in reparations for World War II from Germany? Poland and Germany are in competition. I think Poland is looking at this whole situation, what's happening, as a way to continue its upswing. You know, it's it's really done a lot since 1990, Solidarity Union, and then the fall of the East Bloc and all that stuff of how it's industrialized, how it's come back from being, you know, down for so long. And so there's a lot of um, Polish nationalism. There's a lot of uh, opportunity here. So for them, so it's something to watch, but people don't pay attention to these things. They just look at the headline and they don't uh, kind of look at the backstory. Now, I'm not accusing Poland of anything. I'm just saying this is, a, you know, a beneficiary of what's happening. Um, as deindustrialization takes hold in in Germany and the rest of Western Europe, which is going to happen because as we've talked about before, when you have these complex techno technologically industrial based societies, they required a certain amount of BTU inputs of energy for them to function. And if you take away those BTUs, they cannot function. And so who are the beneficiaries? You know, the problem is, is that Europe can print euros, well, for some period of time um, and pay for more energy outbid Pakistan or these other countries around the world, which you've already seen Egypt or whoever, you know, all these developing countries for the gas and the, and the, and the cargoes will come to Europe. But how long can they do that for? Because they're not creating any real wealth. They're just going to be able to print money. And we saw that, you know, recently in the UK where the government, I talked about this a couple of weeks ago, the government created, a, I think, a close to 150 billion pound package to, uh, ameliorate the higher energy prices. And now um, they're talking about doing the same thing in the EU or in Germany specifically. I think I saw a number around 200 billion euros. They don't have this money. They're just going to create it out of thin air. So these are more, more pressure on the currencies. This is another reason why the currencies are going down. Uh, this deindustrialization. You know, there are certain commentators uh, that think this is all a big plan. I just think it's a bunch of stupid people that have gotten a lot of things wrong. And uh, now the chickens are coming home to roost. Suffice to say that I want to talk about this, you know, cargoes uh, for LNG carriers rates are like pushing $100,000 per day now. And so, you know, this is, this is the situation. This was before the pipeline was destroyed. These pipelines were destroyed. And so another thing that I think is possibly going to happen and, uh, there was an interesting article. I think I briefly touched on this a few weeks ago. Um, Adam Rosenzweig at Gory Rosenzweig talked about how U.S. and world, or at least European gas prices, could come more into balance. Right now, obviously, U.S. gas prices are a lot less than they are in Europe, which gives us an advantage, which gives us an advantage in manufacturing that's very heavily dependent on gas, natural gas, fertilizer production cement production, steel production, glass production. These things are very energy intensive and require um, natural gas uh, quite, quite a bit. But even, you know, smaller like factories and industries that require steam or heat in their process, they use small industrial boilers that run on natural gas. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But getting into the supply here, most new LNG projects coming on stream to from 2026 plus are from Qatar and the USA. LNG prices expected to remain high for several years due to market imbalance. And so 
that goes back to countries that have energy security, countries that have their own energy resources will be more uh, able to withstand this. They will have a competitive advantage against other countries. Wink, wink, back to the original discussion we just had. Okay, who benefits? Qui bono? Um, and, uh, you know, again, uh, there are going to be beneficiaries and there's going to be losers. Uh, this deindustrialization of Europe and specifically Germany uh, does benefit certain parties. Um, remember, I don't believe in this like cabal of 12 or 15 people sitting around a, you know, smoke filled room with a 40 watt light bulb over the table where they determine what's going to happen. There's various interests all around involved here, right? You have the military industrial congressional complex, you know, they're what they used to call French mercenaries, you know, the horrors that people that just want war regardless, because it's to their benefit, they make money. You have neocons in the West, various positions who are trying to work out an agenda for US hegemony. That's another faction. You have people that are just opportunists in renewable energy, that they see money, so they uh, are falling in line with this. Uh, it just goes around. And so a lot of these things, their interests overlap. It's not necessarily a huge conspiracy. Uh, but, uh, you know, that, that's my view, at least. And when these things overlap, you know, yes, occasionally, uh, you know, as I've said before, people of wealth and power conspire to get more wealth and power. Uh, nothing new here. But this is what you can expect. Higher prices for gas in places where it needs to be imported. Um, developing world's going to suffer because if you were, if you were relying on LNG as an import, you're going to have it, the inability to bid it away from Europe. It's going to be bid to Europe. Now this, I guess, you know, if sufficient investment is made that this can be solved, but again, this takes time, just like this total slide says here, 2026 timeframe. So that's four years. I mean, four years is a long time for people to be poor and hungry. Um, and then you see like European crisis emphasizes the role of natural gas as a transition fuel. You know, we keep this view still seems to be there that we're going to have this transition to some undefined zero carbon renewable powered society. Uh, again, I, char I, I really think people should read the Charles Hall textbook, Energy Return on Investment. People should read Vaclav Schmiel. You cannot have this lifestyle and way of living that you have in the West without tremendous energy inputs of consistent, reliable energy inputs. This is without a doubt. And so this is the opportunity because we have to look at the policies that are being promulgated by the policymakers. And if they're incorrect, then we have to take the other side. And that's why I think energy is going to be uh, because of the underinvestment, because of the lack of understanding of how uh, complex things are, the lack of understanding around simple ideas like thermodynamics and things like this. This is where our opportunity is because these decisions are being made from a political basis, not from a basis of science or physics or engineering. Oops. Okay, so this was an interesting, I uh, just saw this on Twitter. I wanted to point this out. You know, the view that we have towards, oh, that I have towards the federal, say we, like there's some, you know, team here, it's just myself. But the view that I have is that the Fed's going to do like it always does. It's going to, you know, it panicked and cut rates to zero and kept them there too long. I mean, these people don't know what they're doing. I mean, I, I think it's, you know, people disagree with me on that, but has the history of what they've done proven to you that they have some kind of magic plan that they kind of actually know what they're doing. I, I don't see it. And I've been following this for decades. So what we see here, these are some of the previous rate hiking cycles. And you can see when I talk about, this is what I wanted to illustrate to you guys. When I talk about they're going to raise rates until something breaks, this is what I'm talking about. You know, let's go back and look at the various other situations, right? Uh, rate raising cycles. And you can see this is the amount of months of the cycle from when it began to when it ended. This is the change in effective federal funds rate in the cycle. And you can see that we are on the steepest, quickest rate raising cycle ever. This is why we're having all of the turmoil in the markets uh, as the markets adjust to this and reprice based on this. We haven't really seen things break. You know, we did see the 
you know, we are starting to see cracks. You know, um, we're seeing emerging market debt. We're seeing, you know, even developed markets like the UK um, are fracturing where they, where the central bank had to come in and buy bonds to save the pension funds there. Um, and we're going to see more of that, right? They were, you know, and so eventually what happens is something breaks, causes a market, severe market dislocation such that it cannot be ignored. And then the Fed does what? They reverse course and begin another rate cutting cycle and reflation. And so you go 94, 95, you had the bond market crash, 99 to 2000, the dot-com crash, um, 04 to 06, financial crisis, 87 market crash, Eurozone crisis, Fed taper tantrum. You remember that when Mr. Powell had to reverse himself. Um, so we don't know what this is. You know, Michael Burry was on Twitter the other day showing like there's, uh, he had a list of the 200 and some, some odd companies in the, um, I think, it, I don't know if it was in the, maybe it was in the S&P anyways, that are basically insolvent. So maybe we see a corporate debt you know, problem, um, high yield debt explosion. That's probably going to happen. Re obviously, real estate's blown up. I'm, it's funny. I have this little hobby on Sundays after in the afternoon. I kind of just get on Zillow for the neighborhood I'm in because right now, you know, I'm working on these jobs up here in Houston. I have a house in the Valley and I'm going to try to get into a lease option deal when my, um, when my, leases up next May. Why? Because I'm already seeing all these houses that they have in this area that I live in. There's price cuts like you wouldn't believe. They've started and they're pretty substantial. Okay. Um, houses that were 400,000 with $50,000 price cuts already. And this is just the beginning. Then starting to see acceleration of this because basically at 7% mortgage rates, this thing freezes, right? You, you're not, nobody's going to buy any houses. I'm not going to say anybody, but it's going to, it's going to contract massively. And so you're going to see a real estate, you're going to see problems in real estate. And there's, you know, there's a company that takes, takes advantage of that. We may talk about in the newsletter. Um, but this is what I wanted to point out. This is what happens. They will raise rates till something breaks. Then that gives them the air cover to enter another rate cutting cycle. And this being an unprecedented amount of tightening in such a short time, in basically six months, um, you've basically increased rates, you know, over 3%. And with the economy so indebted, it just can't sustain this incoming fire. Um, it just can't uh, hold up. And so that's why you're seeing, you know, there is a good chance that, uh, you know, if they keep doing what they're doing, that we could get a total um, puke in the markets. But uh, I want to talk about that next slide, kind of talks about that a little bit. So are we near a bottom? You know, I have a lot of people calling the bottom, which probably means we're not at a bottom, but um, this is Sediment Trader on Twitter. This is a pretty good uh, Twitter person to follow. Uh, they have pretty good information. I wanted to point this out. They talk about the American Association of Individual Investors. This is your retail people. This is a, this is a, 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 a following their sediment, following what they're doing in the markets in a good way, a tool to look at sediment and to look for turning points when they become overly bearish or overly bullish. And so what they said here was, this week joins just four others, four other periods in 35 years with more than 60% of respondents being despondent in the, Amer in the Association of American uh, Individual Investors Survey. The other four times that that happened, the one year returns after were 20, you, you can see they were all positive. Uh, but of course, this time is different. So, you know, it could be different. I mean, you never can say that previous performance guarantees future performance. But this is interesting that uh, a lot of your retail, a lot of people now, what's everybody talking about? I see, you know, I was buying the, I bought a tranche of these I bonds that are inflation protected. You can buy them from the Treasury Direct website. And I think they're paying like 9% right now or something crazy like that. Um, but you can't only, you can only buy like 10 grand worth. It's just somewhere to park some cash for some, you know, but everybody now is starting to buy bonds. Isn't that interesting? Now everybody's buying bonds and should I get to just a two year bond or should I buy further out or T bills? How do I do that? All this discussion about that. 
uh, by normal people that never do that. So that probably means that we might be <laughs> closer to a top in this in the bond market than or a bottom in the bond market than uh, and topping in rates. I, I don't have a future crystal ball, but you know, again, this I wanted to show you this that um, individual investors are, are are very despondent, you know, and this in the past we've got this bad. Um, it's indicated a turning point so that a year later, the market was higher. So I think it's fully possible we could go lower and then go higher. Um, I don't know exactly what's going to happen. Like I said, we're kind of an unprecedented, uh, you know, with all of the government intervention, with all the intervention from the Fed, with all the misallocation of resources, with all of these things piled up decade after decade, you know, you always have the perma bears that say, this is it, it's going to crack finally and come tumbling down who, who really knows but i think this is an interesting thing to contemplate um from a uh, uh market history perspective so this is kind of what i wanted to talk about uh this is kind of actionable um you know we've talked about it now for months now even before the conflict started in ukraine that there was already going to be an energy crisis in europe and in the world We were skewing the portfolio in the actionable intelligence portfolio towards that uh, thesis. And, you know, now we're here and of course it's been exacerbated and, and had gas thrown on the fire with the um, Russian invasion of Ukraine and the subsequent, you know, energy issues that go along with that. And so what we're seeing now, one thing we talked about before and others have talked about, it's gaining more traction now, and I wanted to bring it to your attention, is the gas to oil switching that's going to start happening, and it is happening in Europe. So what do I mean by that? So I don't know how familiar you are, everybody is here, but not just in power plants. So you go to a power plant and they design power plants to burn a certain fuel. In many cases, in a power plant, I'm talking about an electrical generation station, you know, these big stations, 600, 800, 1,000 megawatt stations, um, typically they burn coal. Now, they don't just take chunks of coal, they pulverize it in these pulverizers where it grinds it down into like a dust, and then it's shot into the boiler, uh, into the firebox of the boiler, and it's, you know, you get a better burn that way, it's more efficient, you get, you get higher pressures and temperatures. Um, and so that's how that's done. Now, a lot of times when they set these things up, they will have the ability to burn one or you know more than one fuel. So you have the burner front, you have the front of the boiler with the burner front with the different burners on there, depending on how many they have. I mean, there can be all kinds of configurations, but suffice to say that you can have you can change it out. You can have natural gas back up, you could have uh, oil and gas, you could have coal and gas, coal and oil, uh, sometimes they're just for single fuel. So then you have, you know, your industrial boilers, like in the process, you have a, you have an industrial process here at this brewery, probably requires a certain amount of steam, uh, heat, whatever for their process, maybe they need steam and hot water to clean vessels, I don't know the process in this particular thing, but you look at different processes like in chemical plants, um, they have all types of needs and refineries for huge amounts of steam at certain pressures and temperatures for the processes that are being run there. And so you could have a set of industrial boilers here. They're not super huge, but they could be spread out throughout the plant and say they run off natural gas. It's not a big deal to change out the burners to burn oil or burn some other fuel like distillate, diesel, whatever. Uh, the, the, the problem might be is how do you know if you've got all the piping for your fuel, uh, say you've got an industrial boiler here, different ones, different sizes inside this plant, they're probably all piped up to a natural gas system that was built in when it was, you know, when the, when the plant was built and commissioned. And so you could run new lines, tubing, uh, you'd have to get an oil tank if you don't have one outside and set up like a pumping skid, make, build yourself a skid with the pump to get to move the move the liquid fuel whether you're using distillate or whatever to the boiler but it's not a big deal i mean you can go on youtube and look at uh, how quickly and easily it is on an industrial boiler to change out the burners same thing in a big electrical plant i mean you can change out the burners 
or the what they call guns uh for the different fuel and you know a shift same thing you can do here in a, like you know before lunch if you started with this you could just unbolt everything disconnect it put the new burner on and reconnect it just getting the fuel there if you're not if you don't if the, if the thing wasn't designed to use liquid fuels and you don't have a source and you would have to bring all that and put it together somehow and probably get some variants on permits to have like a tanker sitting there with a skid pumping uh, you, you you could you could do that it's possible to do that so what we're seeing is people are starting to do that and here it is like Carlsberg, which is a brewer, has converted the brewery supplying beverages to its homeland of Denmark to run on oil instead of gas to avoid having it shut down amid Europe's energy crisis. So the long story short here is the fact that um, people are going to adapt if they can, right? They're not going to go out of business because gas shut down. If they can burn oil, they're going to. And so um, what I suggest is I'm going to put a link. I didn't want to use any of the information without asking uh, Bison Interest, but Bison Interest made a white paper recently talking about this exact issue of gas to oil switching in, in, the, in Europe um, and the forecasts, various ranges of forecasts that they made. I think I saw the number around 800,000 barrels a day of additional oil demand for this gas to oil switching um, and how that would affect, you know, oil markets. So again, people, if they're allowed to, they will find a, in its economic, they will find a way to overcome, adapt and overcome. And that's what, this is just one example that we've seen. It's among many, it's not the only company. So we're going to see more of this, obviously, if, unless, you know, environmentalists and regulators don't let them do it, but uh, if you can do it, they will do it and uh, to keep the, keep things going. So I think it's, this is an interesting trend to watch. And uh, again, you you need a certain amount of BTUs in this process to make Carlsberg beer. If you take the BTUs away, the process stops. And so the management has the responsibility and is going to try to overcome that by introducing a new uh, constituent of BTUs, i.e. oil, or some derivative of oil, distillate, diesel, whatever they're going to use there. So um, look more of this and look for that to help pressure upward oil prices. Um, remember, the SPR draws are coming to an end. This is October. They're supposed to end this month. You know, we have the election, the congressional election next month. I'm cynically uh, think that the ploy was to, you know, uh, draw down the SPR to try to, you know, affect oil prices to the downside. That's coming to an end more than likely. I mean, you, that can't go on forever. Um, and I think that a lot of things uh, that people haven't been talking about is the, the OPEC is going to meet directly in Vienna, I think next week. I think is what the news I'm say. And the idea is to cut uh, OPEC production by 500,000 barrels to a million barrels a day. And so again, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm bullish on energy regardless of what happens because the problem with the inflation situation is that we don't have enough supply of things. And so when we created all of this cash and these currency units and we didn't do anything to ameliorate or fix the lack of supply of materials and energy to go into these complex systems, they go up in price and that hasn't been fixed. And so, yes, we can crush demand, we can crush the economy, we can force demand down and by that way, uh, but we can only do that for so long uh, before we have to reverse because they're not going to drive the economy into a deflationary depression. This is not going to happen. As soon as something breaks, they're going to reverse. This is their pattern. And the problem is, is what will the inflation rate be when they do that? What, you know, part of the, part of the, you know, a lot of, a lot of um, credit is given to Paul Volcker for crushing inflation by raising rates to 20%. But a lot of academic studies have happened, well, not a lot, but there's been a few, and people have commented on this, that a lot of the credit goes to the deregulation of the economy done um, after Carter, when the Reagan administration came in and cut regulations, uh, stimulated you know economic activity, deregulated various industries, and this had a lot to do with bringing prices down because supply was increased, regulatory uh, interference uh, in the economy was lifted, and that had you know I don't I don't know the exact numbers off my head, but yes, crushing demand uh, had a lot to do with it, but I think a lot of it had to do with a you know almost eight-year period, or if you want to say 
when Bush senior came in 12 year period of deregulation and, you know, uh, of the economy. So, um, what needs to happen is we need more production. I mean, you saw Liz Truss. I think Liz Truss is a goofball in the UK, the PM, but at least she's doing the right things. But the problem is the things that she's suggesting are going to take years, increasing drilling in the North Sea, bringing back fracking for the shale gas that the trillions of cubic feet of shale gas that the UK has onshore. Um, that's going to be, that's going to be a hard road to hoe just because of the opposition you're going to have, you know, committing to a long-term build out of nuclear power in the UK. These are all the right things, that, but these things should have been done 10, 10 or 15 years ago. And so, you know, will the political situation allow for this to happen or is there going to be, you know, you know, will the political situation in the UK or in the EU allow, you know, there's a tremendous amount of shale and, and, and gas in, in uh, the EU still. I mean, for heaven's sakes, the Dutch have sh are shutting down one of the largest offshore gas fields that they control because of climate change. I mean, it's just the wrong policies, folks. I mean, it's not like the molecules don't exist. There's just no political will to exploit them. And that's a whole nother discussion of why that is. And, but, you know, that's why, you know, we're starting to see the first beginnings of the change in the political situation in these places. Long story short, we're short of energy. We have a molecule crisis. People are going to do what they have to do to keep their business going. What, what is Carlsberg going to do? The board of directors and the management just say, well, we don't have any natural gas, shut the brewery down. And I guess we go out of business. I mean, they're going to try to try to uh, adapt. And we're going to see this ex across the entire continent. Um, here's a Ramco saying spare capacity is 1.5% of global demand. They're saying, Ramco CEO, effective global spare capacity is now about 1.5% of global demand. That would be 1.5 million barrels. Um, and that's with China in lockdowns and flights not yet at 2019 levels. So, you know, if we assume 100 million barrels a day of demand, plus or minus, I mean, probably a little bit to the minus, maybe 98, 99, wherever we're at right now, um, you're talking about 1%, 1.5% buffer. And, uh, you know, that's without that's with you know major economies in recession that's with china with still with the covid lockdowns this is another reason why it's kind of it's kind of amazing to me how well oil prices are holding up um even with what we have happening so when this thing reverses which it will inevitably these things will reverse um and you know if we get to 102 103 million barrels of demand the world doesn't have it and so you can you can tell what's going to happen. That's going that's going to that's the result of poor policy decisions being made around the world and the lack of investment in new resources and reserves. I mean, the chickens are coming home to roost. So I'll put this video up. Um, more super cycle news uh, for um, this is at a conference. Um, this is a guy giving a presentation. He's from Pareto Securities. They do a lot of discussion around the global shipping. Uh, so we believe in a super cycle, but what is the market pricing compared to previous up cycles? So they go into this short video. I'm not going to play it on here. I'll put a link to it. You can check it out. We've had a pullback in shipping rates recently in tankers, but uh, I don't think anything's really changed. Um, now, Part of the reason why is because we're having this discussion around OPEC cutting um, that could affect VLCC, very large crude carrier demand. Obviously, you want to see it's beneficial for crude carriers, Suez Max and VLCC rates, if the amount of crude that needs to be hauled is higher. But don't forget that the global trade routes, and global trade um, and oil trade markets have changed because of the sanctions on Russia and all of that that we've talked about before. So you get these pullbacks, um, uh, you know, not only that, you have the market itself being weak, which drags all stocks down. But I still think uh, I'm still bullish um, on what I'm seeing on the tankers. Um, I don't know if it's a super cycle. I, 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 this is what a lot of people are saying. That doesn't mean it is. But I would say that the performance of the tanker stocks, both the crude carriers and the 
clean tankers or the product um, tanker market has done very well and continues to do well. So we're going to have ups and downs. We'll see. But like I said, when these things reverse, when when people start cutting cutting rates, when people reverse the inflation trade, uh, the demand for energy is going to go up. When China eventually, well, I suspect they're eventually going to end this COVID uh, lockdown madness, let their economy start to recover. Um, we'll see increases in crude movements around the world. Um, and like I said, as long as this Russian thing goes on, I mean, you've, you've disjointed the product uh, market around the world. Not only that, there, you know, there still is around the world a diesel shortage. We're well below the five-year average for diesel stocks around the world. And so that requires more hauling of products from places where there are refineries like China and India and the Middle East to the product where the markets are for these products. So uh, I continue to be bullish on the tankers uh, longer term. And so here we go, you know, tanker rates making new highs. This is from last week. Shell paying $110,000 per day as September VLCC cargoes hit second highest level ever. It's just a news item. Um, but, you know, you got to remember, it's not like a, the markets are different just based on different regions around the world. It depends what the voyage is. It, you know, these things are constantly shifting in real time, but uh, this is, this is a pretty high rate for, for a day rate for a tanker. So wanted to get into this again, um, more discussion. I think I try to point things out uh, about the so-called energy transition, uh, whatever that means, you know, people talk about it. Uh, they don't really define their words. We don't really know what they're talking about. It's kind of muddled in people's minds what this means. But what's not muddled is the amount of material that's needed to do what's being proposed. So this article kind of gets into it. It says more than 300 new mines will be needed globally to meet growing demand for electric vehicle batteries, according to a new forecast from a mining analyst. Benchmark Mineral Intelligence estimates at least 384 new mines for graphite, lithium, nickel, and cobalt will be required to meet electric vehicle demand by 2035. If battery materials can be recycled in large enough quantities, the firm says about 336 new mines would be needed. If battery materials can be recycled in large enough quantities. If. Um, I know people are talking about it, but I don't think it's being done in large amounts profitably right now, but we'll see. Uh, anything's possible. I don't discount technology. I don't discount count the, the advancement of science and the ability of people to come up with new processes. But if, if they can recycle a large enough, then we'll only need 336 new mines by 2035, which is 13 years from now. And the average time when you start looking for a material until the mine comes online is 10 to 15 years. So I don't see the amount of mining exploration going on sufficient to do this, but you know, then things could change. You could get a new technology for batteries that doesn't require certain minerals. I know that's what a lot of advocates for this are saying, but getting things from the lab into real life manufacturing and high levels of production those are two different things, which a lot of people seem to forget. And so you read like, I get the MIT technology magazine also. So there's all kinds of cool things in there every month. They're doing this and they're doing that. And they found this process and they found that and they made it work in the lab. But then when the engineers get in and say, well, how am I supposed to scale this into an industrial process? How am I supposed to do this? A lot of times that's where it falls down. Or when we talk about, you know, there was a lot of talk I saw at the renewable conference about hydrogen. Hydrogen is not a fuel, folks. Okay, it's not something you go out and drill for. Like there's hydrogen deposits everywhere. Hydrogen is an energy carrier, and so the problem again, as we've discussed, and I showed the slide a couple of weeks ago, is like let's say that you're going to uh, use wind power to power a, an electrolysis uh, process in order to um, take water and get hydrogen from it. Okay. Well, if you get a certain, like we said, like we showed, if you get like, let's assume a hundred energy units out of your wind turbine, by the time you go through the whole process and the end user gets the fuel, you lose like 70 or 80% of the energy. 
because every time you do a transition, every time you transport, every time that you change states, you lose energy. Okay, this is why I keep telling everybody, read that Charles Hall book because it describes all of this. It talks about thermodynamics and entropy and all of these things and energy um, when you change states that you, um, when you go from potential energy to uh, kinetic energy, you have losses. Like your car is only like 25% efficient because you have all these heat losses and friction losses with the tire and the internal components yada, yada, yada. Okay. So you have a lot of losses that are irrecoverable. You remember energy is not, you cannot destroy or create energy. It just changes state. So you have a lot of waste heat. Okay. This is where a lot of the losses come from and you can't fix that. Okay. That's just how it is. It's the same thing. You know, if you already take a intermittent power source like wind to create electrolysis, you're going to have these losses. When the wind hits the turbine blades, there's losses there. The transition into the gearbox there's losses there, heat and friction losses. These are all cumulative, folks. This is, and they cannot be eliminated. This is physics, okay? This is engineering. And so this is what most people don't understand. And so just saying that we need 300 new mines, okay, well, who's developing these mines? Because if you listen to the mining executives from Anglo and Rio Tinto and BHP, they're not out there investing billions of dollars right now building new mines. Everywhere they go to do it, they have protests. They have to deal with, you know, indigenous groups. They have to, you know, get sued in all kinds of government, uh, federal courts around the world to stop them. And so where are these new mines coming from? This is the opportunity. Heads we win, tails we win more. That's why hydrocarbons are not going away for decades and decades and decades. Yes, they're going to keep pushing this transition. Hopefully the light bulb will go off in somebody's head and they'll say, you know what? Um, in order to do this, we have to actually mine materials. This is what really the problem is. A lot of people that are policymakers don't understand where the materials come from. If you don't grow it or you don't mine it, you don't have it. People really do not understand this. They say, well, there's the solar farm. There's the, uh, it just happened, right? It just materialized. Now, I'm not trying to be, you know, glib, but that's, people don't know. Except for cobalt, Miller said there are enough minerals in the ground. This is correct. There is no shortage of minerals. The shortage is the investment and time to get it out of the ground to meet growing demand for batteries. But mines take years to develop. There are types of batteries called lithium iron phosphate batteries that no longer need cobalt, however. That's true. But you still need iron and phosphate and lithium. At the end of the decade, the desire is to make between 25 million and 40 million EVs. If you count the Chinese and Tesla. Okay, well, we'll see if it happens. Um, right now, I think lithium prices are at like near all time highs. And we really even haven't ramped this up yet. So we will see. That's why I have the thesis. It doesn't really matter what I think politically or philosophically about this. It's heads we win with hydrocarbons because they're not going away and you need them to power this energy transition. And tails we win more because if they're going to do this, the opportunities and all this mining and materials is going to be huge. Heads we win, tails we win more. It's that simple. Uh, here's an interesting article I found. It was a kind of a op-ed piece. I'll put a link to it. Uh, the title is, The Headlong Rush to Net Zero Makes a New Great Depression a Racing Certainty. A couple of excerpts, excerpts. An article in The Critic asks if we are facing another Great Depression. I'm surprised that there isn't is any doubt about it. 20 years of vandalism. I like this. Uh, this is kind of... I appreciate this type of writing. 20 years of vandalism of the energy system was only ever going to have one result and will not be fixed in a hurry. But how did we end up here? Why did we let it happen? The answers lie in two great tricks that have been played on the public. Firstly, the man in the street has been led to believe that global warming is a crisis. Make no mistake, this is a lie. That's because in the official view of the IPCC, unabated global warming might lead to a 3.6% Celsius of warming and result in a loss of just 2.6% of GDP. That's from the IPCC. So even if we don't do anything, we could lose 2.6% of GDP. That's kind of like, you know, a pretty severe recession. We could, we could adapt to that. Instead, we're going to, you know, destroy our hydrocarbon economy, uh, not look at nuclear and go with intermittent power sources that we don't have the mineral resources available to make. Okay. 
The second trick has been played by the renewables industry and green activists, which have together persuaded most people that an energy transition is possible. To do this, they have engaged in a 20-year campaign of disinformation about the costs of wind and solar power and about the availability of storage technologies for when the wind stops blowing and the sun isn't shining. This is absolutely true. I've been in this renewable industry now for almost 10 years, okay? And um, the technologies work. I, we make wind power into electricity, solar power. But the problem is the sun doesn't shine. The wind doesn't always blow. So then we're told batteries. But then again, you ask the question about the materials or the constituents of the batteries, we don't, it's not there. And if you start doing, these are spreadsheet exercises, but the current technologies or even the technologies that are being proposed, you know, if you go, let's say, you know, we had that cold, cold spot in Texas a couple, couple of years ago, and I was actually on a job and I had to go out and help a friend who was running a plant um they blew up a current transformer we had to get one from another plant i mean the plant was down while this current transformer exploded i mean it's a you know 150 megawatt plant wind farm and this was in the middle of you know um this wind so uh, ostensibly what would happen i guess policymakers say well you would have battery backup and the batteries would carry that but it took us two days to do that so how big is this battery supposed to be what about nighttime you know, there's still demand, you know, your air conditioner or heaters running at night while you're sleeping, you're, you're, there's cert still a certain amount of electricity demand. So if you had several days of overcast or you had a hurricane go through like in, like in Florida right now, and what would that do to the panels? What would that do to the infrastructure? Uh, you get everything back going again, you're not going to rebuild the solar farm. What do you do if you don't have any backup? You just have the batteries there. Well, they discharge and then what? How big are these batteries? You know, put together a spreadsheet and say, okay, how much, this is again, it's another, this law of large numbers that people seem to get lost in. How much energy is required to allow the state of Florida, the United States of America to continue on just in its current state? For all of the things that you enjoy, all the things you take for granted, how much is it? Well, it's measured in the terawatts, trillions and trillions of watts. And so people have done these exercises. They're out there. You can do them yourself. You can, there's conversion mechanisms so you can convert BTUs to kilowatts, kilowatts to BTUs and megawatts. This is all can be done. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll, I, I did this in an exercise when I was in an environmental class at university and said, if we're going to run the entire world or United States on wind power and assume three megawatt machines and a certain capacity factor. I mean, it was millions and millions of wind turbines. I mean, so like a certain 10% of the population would be, you know, these things would be everywhere. The problem is, is the resources don't exist everywhere. And you're just going to have these things all over the place and how many people are involved in maintaining them. And it just, you know, it didn't make sense. And so, um, I agree with this, uh, with this, uh, I don't think people really know, you know, I talked, like I said, I, I mentioned this before I talked to this guy's attorney, I had him on a interview series. He writes, uh, um, a blog called Manhattan contrarian. And I kind of asked him, he's a pretty smart guy all around. And I said, you know, if this is so obvious to you and I talking about this, how can he said, well, you know, the average person doesn't think about this. Does the average person speak Chinese? No. Why not? Because they have no need to speak Chinese. It's the same thing. Does anybody really have the need, the average person, to understand how this entire energy system works? No, they don't. They have an expectation that they go to a light switch, flip it, and it comes on. They have the expectation that when the light, the low fuel light on their car comes on, they pull into a gas station and fill it up. This is just like the extent of the thinking. It's not, doesn't mean they're bad people. It doesn't mean that they're idiots. They have no need to know about this because it's so ubiquitous and so. Uh, the, the, the buy the recency bias is there that, you know, today is like yesterday. That means tomorrow will be like today. I mean, that's how people think that's just human nature. And so it's going to, you know, as you can see what's happening in Europe now, the two by four is upside the head and people actually have to think about these things now because their life is asked is drastically being altered. And that's really what it's going to take in my view. And again, it's not some vast conspiracy. Okay. It's, you know, 
people that are environmentalists that genuinely believe that we're destroying the earth. So they think that green energy is the way to go. There are people that are radical environmentalists that hate humans, that hate themselves. They want, they think there's too many people. If they had power, they would do all kinds of weird, wild things. There's people that when an industry comes into fruition, like renewables did and has grown over the decades, they infest it, lawyers, lobbyists, people, you know, that are there to, you know, feed at the trough. Uh, there's regulators that uh, get put into power and they like their power and position. So they continue to, you know, and this machine, this thing is like a snowball. It starts rolling downhill and then who's going to stand in front of it and stop it. Like I said, I went to this conference in Anaheim. There's 40,000 people there and everybody's so excited because the inflation reduction act is going to allow for years and years of this industry to, you know, benefit. Whether it's for the common good is irrelevant. Again, you're not going to convince somebody to change their mind when their livelihood depends on them not changing their mind. And so this is what you have. And you have politicians that benefit from this because if you're a politician that supports this transition, then you're going to support legislation. The slop comes down from D.C. or from the state legislature, it goes into these people, it's circular, right? Then it goes back to the legislature with campaign contributions. That's why we call this military industrial congressional complex, right? Because, you know, the def same thing where I have problems with pharma lobbying and military industrial defense company lobbying, you know, legislation's passed in the defense budget. The money goes to the defense contractors, and a certain amount of that goes back to Congress and, and the Senate as campaign contributions. This is not hard to understand. People respond to incentives. So if you put money out there, it's going to, you know, you put honey out, it attracts flies or bees or whatever. Okay. It's just that simple. This is not like, you know, hard to understand. And so once these things get, you know, in going they're like tumors, right? You're not just going to wish it away or say, well, that's a bad thing. I want it to go away. You have to go out and cut it out. And who's going to do that? You know, there's no incentive. Who's, who's, this, who's this Huey Long person that's going to come along and take on all this? These things are so entrenched and so powerful. It's Once they get in, in, in there, you, you can't get them out. And so it takes a complete wheels have to fall off before things can really be changed. So I wanted to put this up here, uh, John Quakes. Like I said, he does a really good job on cataloging like all of the nuclear industry and uranium industry news. And so um, he has a box he set up. You can see it down here at the bottom. I'll put a link to it where he catalogs like all of the news. It's like seven or eight pages. And so I think it's really useful. I mean, he does really good work on this. I don't want to get into all the rest of the stuff. You know, I mean, this is what he's done for years. And uh, he's done a really good job. So this is all free. You can go to it and read like all of, he does this consistently too. He puts these up and uh, kind of, like I said, catalogs all of the positive news that's happening and why, why we are so bullish on the um, nuclear industry and uranium fuel industry. And so here we go. This is why I'm such an advocate. I mean, again, People are going to quibble with this. Who made this chart? What were the assumptions? But this is pretty consistent of what we've seen over time, right? This is, you know, energy return on investment with storage, without storage. And you see, um, you know, solar PV without storage. You get four units of energy back for every unit invested, which is not, you cannot run a society on that. I mean, if you read... Uh, like I said, Charles Hall's book, he talks about just to maintain the current civilization, you need like seven to 10 uh, EROI. Um, it just, there's a lot of debate around that, but that's, you know, what a lot of people say that have studied this, you need seven to 10 EROI in order to, you know, maintain the civilization, much less grow it. And so then you get into these other ones like wind and, and they say, well, why does the, why does the EROI go down? when you add storage because it's so energy intensive to make these batteries that's why see this is what people don't understand now whether these numbers are dead nuts on and correct is irrelevant if they're close this is a problem 
And this is why, you know, people say, you know, you just want to destroy the earth. You're a shill for the oil companies. Not me personally, but people that advocate for it. Alex Epstein, people like this. This is why we use it, because the energy return on, inve on investment is so large. That's why. That's what's facilitated civilization growing. You know, what changed my mind on this, and I, and, and I don't know what the name of the book is. I have to find it, was a book about energy. It wasn't specifically on energy, but it was about like medieval times, about how people lived. It did talk about energy return. I can't remember the exact title of the book, but it, it was striking to me because you know, there was no coal, there was no uh, nuclear, there was no petroleum, there was no solar panels or wind farms in the 11th and 12th century. What the people had was solar energy that made crops grow, that made grass grow and hay. And these people were dependent on that solar energy. But, you know, plants are not that efficient in transforming solar energy into, you know, sugars and calories. And so, the energy return on energy investment was like two or three to one. So basically, that's why the industry was predominantly agricultural. And that's why you didn't have a lot of advancement. You know, that's why economic growth was only like over those thousands of years was like 0.5% per year. But that was, you know, compounding over thousands of years. But you saw what happened since the dawn of using, you know, these high energy return fuels since the Industrial Revolution population has exploded on earth okay the wealth has exploded on this earth why because you have excess energy that allows you to do to have people go off and make movies to have people go off and work on rockets to send to space most people before all this for the most part were scratching out a living like hobbits with their draft animals so you know you were trying to raise enough hay and fodder to get through the winter with your draft animals and raise enough food and put it up in storage so that you could make it through the winter. And if you had a bad harvest, if you had a drought, if the whatever, when you had the solar minimums and things, adult minimum and the mounder minimum, people starved to death because there wasn't enough energy being, you know, uh, coming from the sun to make enough crops or there was too much rain or there was not enough rain. Okay. So we don't really have those problems so much we still have droughts and stuff like that, but we, the technology we have, the people that are able to um, get into manufacturing and all these other little things that we do that we take for granted is all because we have an excess of energy inputs. I, I, I cannot, this is like my new thing that I keep pounding on. And I really, a light bulb has really went off in my head over the last year as I've studied this. You really need to understand this because if you don't, you're not going to get it. And policymakers don't understand this. Again, it's not willful ignorance. Some people just are greedy. You know, uh, they're being lobbied. They're in a certain district that's, uh, you know, going to vote a certain way. So they take the money and they advocate for it because to their, you know, people respond to their own, like I said, self-interest. So um, I, I don't really want to get into the fourth generation. I don't know if this number is correct, but these numbers are pretty spot on for these other technologies. And, uh, you know, this is, this is how it is. All right, guys, that's it for this week. Um, again, we appreciate the uh, following. We're like f less than 500 P subscribers to hitting 10,000. Uh, my goal is to try to hit that by the end of the month. We basically are in the last quarter now. So again, um, if you want to support us, the best way to support us is, or support me is to subscribe or like, like the videos. Again, I know I'm provocative. I know, you're not going to, you're not going to please everybody. Some people like what I say. Some people don't like what I say. Some people like me. Some people don't like me. I mean, what are you going to do? I personally, even that's why I let the bad comments go through. Uh, I learned this a long time ago from a person that I respected that, you know, all, all press and attention is good as far as I'm concerned. So that's why I engage people in the comments. Now, again, you know, there's certain limitations to that, but, um, Help us out if you can. If you're listening on uh, one of the podcast platforms, if there's a way to rate us there, we would appreciate it. Obviously, we want positive comments and positive ratings. But, you know, if you think this, you know, these videos stink and you don't like them, then, uh, you know, you should be honest. I, I, I'm not asking you to uh, compromise your values. So anyways, that's it for this week, guys. We'll talk to you next week. Have a good one.